So do you think you associate happiness with pizza? Oh, definitely. Wow. So there's no pepperoni mm. pizza in it. Yeah, you guys make pizza. Right. This is pizza. Health department coming in. ABC coming in. Mm. I got a letter in the mail. I'm getting sued for no less than 20,000. If it makes sense, it's gonna make dollars to them. I hate to say this, but you almost have to put your restaurant first and then your family second. What's up, everybody? We're out here in Chula Vista today, meeting with Mario from Caliano Pizza. Mario, what's up, dude? How are you doing? Fantastic. How are you about yourself? Good, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're here today to kind of just talk about Mario, about running his pizza shop, his pizzeria here, how we got started, all of this good stuff. Business pizza, uh, smash burgers, chopped cheese, all that good thing. So, Mario, please introduce yourself, man. Hello, my name is Mario Maruca, and I'm the owner of Caliano Pizzeria right here in Chula Vista off Brandywine, next to the famous Brandywine Liquor Store, and uh, I love it here. Yeah? You love yeah. it here? Yeah. So give us a little bit of history, dude, because I know you've been in the pizza game for a long time now. A long time. When I say long, I mean really long. <laughs> so I've, you have a lot of experience with it, right? Yes. I've, so, yeah, give us a little bit of background, man. I uh, started out with a mobile pizza oven about 12, 13 years ago. Wow. Cruising around at different locations throughout San Diego. Yeah. Um, the farthest I've taken my wood fire oven is probably Arkansas. Really? Yes. From here to Arkansas? Yeah, my son and I drove the Dude. drove the wood fire oven to Arkansas. Uh-huh. And then probably the farthest north is probably we've done a lot of caterings in Sonoma, Napa. Okay, okay. So yeah, so I've been doing the mobile catering first and then gradually got into the food truck okay and Sweet. then from the food truck that was a an experience of a lifetime <laughs> <laughs> i bet dude and then from there i started a couple brick and mortars okay and then from the brick and mortars uh, the pandemic hit yeah yeah, yeah yeah and then i lost all everything during the pandemic oh, man yeah i bet okay yeah. and i was a little discouraged I i'm bet. not gonna lie yeah yeah and so i found this little spot okay I decided to put my head down again and just make pizzas. Start working, start working. Before this we get, get into that, I kind of want to bring it back to your own history, right? Because we're getting into the food truck and how you got started there, but like, what got you into pizza in the first place? My family. Okay. Um, growing up. Um, From Italy, right? Yeah, well, okay. the, um, I'm uh, very fortunate. Grew up in two countries at the same time. It wasn't like I was born in Italy and came to the United States. It was different. I was born in California and then went to Italy and then went to California and back and forth for numerous years. And, um, but before that, when I was a little kid, my grandmother had her own pizzeria. Wow. She, she made her in own- In Italy? No, here. Oh, Chula, in here? National City, actually. Really? On uh, Highland Avenue. What was, that, what was the name of it? Um, it was called Carmela's. Carmela's, okay. Or, yeah. Oh, well, I didn't know that, man. That's it, cool. Yeah, so it's been uh, something, I guess, in my blood. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So, and then she, after she closed the restaurant, she kept the pizza oven, put it in the, uh, her garage, and we always had pizza parties. Wow, that's really cool. Was the pizza parties like for you or like your family? Like what did you guys everybody, do with Everybody, everybody. Yeah. So like even, it was when I was in preschool, kindergarten, and uh, we would ha bring my whole class over to our house and have pizza parties. Oh yeah? Yeah. Oh dude, I bet they love that. You love pizza parties growing up as a kid, right? Elementary school, pizza yeah. party. That's like the well, best thing there, ever. There's a, crazy story when I was gonna move out of my house when I was seven I mean 18 19 my mom was like well who's gonna take care of you who's gonna cook for you mm. uh, why don't we just build you an oven in the backyard and that's when I got my very first wood fire oven wow how old were you at that time I was 19 oh, okay okay yeah. so so that was my uh, immersed introduction to f to pizza like that's when it just took over but before that when I was growing up in Italy we would have um, the piazzetta or the little piazza and mm -hmm. then all the houses would be around and then there would be businesses and my portone or my uh, how would you say big garage door mm -hmm. you would open it up and then maybe 10 feet to the left was the pizzeria wow so I would hang out in the pizzeria all the time and just watch Franco work and stuff and wow. he seemed like the happiest dude in the world mm -hmm. So, yeah, why wouldn't I want to be that? <laughs> so do you think you associate happiness with pizza? 
Oh, definitely. Oh, man, I think a lot of us do. <laughs> when I think of pizza, I'm like, wow, that probably is good. Yes. And so fr from that moment, so when you were a young kid, 19, doing wood-fired fired pizza, that's what got you into like getting your own food truck for wood-fired pizza? Or like, what was the journey in between that time to there? Well, during that journey, my, my father imported Italian products, and then we had a pasta factory back in Italy, so I did a lot of traveling the country and selling authentic, you know, gourmet, artisanal, whatever word you want to use, food, but it just to us is what we use in Italy, your, nor your normal day things, not some private label that some dude went from the United States over to Italy and said, I want to build my own brand. Mm -hmm. So I would travel the country and sell pasta, olive oil, and tomatoes. But then in 2008, when the economy was taking a really big, yeah. It was hard for us too, so then I went and moved up to Northern California and I worked for a lady by the name of Munyaini mm -hmm. and I taught pizza classes. Wow, dude. So she was the leading importer of wood fire ovens in the United States and she had a 300 acre vineyard of Chardonnay and we, she had a cooking class on it. So if you bought a wood fire oven, you had the opportunity to go to, of course you had to pay for it, but to a cooking class on a 300 acre vineyard of Chardonnay in the middle of Alexander Valley in Sonoma. Sounds like it sucks, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so then we would teach people how to cook, you know, pasta dishes, um, anything you can think of cooking in a conventional oven, we would do in a wood fire oven. Mm -hmm. Your Thanksgiving turkey, uh, steaks, um, you name it, we cooked it in a wood fire wow. oven because you gotta think about it. Before electricity, before you know central plumbing and bringing in gas into your house, yeah. how would you cook? You'd cook right. You would cook with wood fire. So there's a different mythology behind cooking with wood fire compared to any other fuel because when you actually cook with wood, besides if it's seasoned like correctly, yeah. you'll still release moisture into your product so you actually have a humified air instead of a dry conventional heat. So you can cook things about 30% quicker mm. and not, if you do it correctly, you will not- um, Burn it? No, it won't be dry. Oh, okay, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like um, when you're cooking in your oven at home, you have an oven and all you're doing is swirling around hot air, hoping it's gonna cook everything inside. But when you're cooking with a wood fire oven, you actually have three sources of heat. You have the oven deck, but that's what you cook a pizza with. So that's gonna be one temperature. You have the radiant heat from the fire. Mm -hmm. And then you have what you call a natural conventional heat because the way it's designed with the mouth on the front and the flue on the top, it actually, and it's a dome, it actually sucks in the oxygen, swirls it around and then shoots it back out the top. Wow. So it's all a Neapolitan science, I guess. Well, I, I never knew any of that, so <laughs> I thought the heat just came from the fire. I didn't know like the deck had a, had a heat oh, to it. Oh, so it's stuff. A, yeah, it's, a, it's wow. So yeah, it's something that um, even in Italy, the ovens are a little bit different. Where they, it's a big dome, and then they actually take the hot air or the smoke, and they run it with, through a channel back up, and then on top of the oven. So wow. they're using it to. They're trying to capsulate more heat. Yeah. It's a completely thing, but it's actually, people don't realize, it's actually the deck that cooks the oven. Uh -huh. If it's the correct terracotta, it actually will absorb the moisture out of the dough, and that's how you can cook in the Neapolitan standard of 900 degrees, 90 seconds, mm. and boom, your pizza's done. Dude, sounds like an artwork, right? Yes. Like, you have to be really good, and like, you learn the heats and all, like, everything you're saying, I'm just like, whoa, I didn't know this, there was this much into it. You actually can go to a university in Naples. It's more focused on yeah. pizza, it's, okay. uh, it's, and then it's VPN certified, and then you're, you, uh, yeah. A lot of Italians do not believe what we make in the United States is pizza. Really? Oh, yeah, well, it's... Wait, yeah. why? Why, though? Because non è come noi facciamo in Italia. It's not like what we make in Italy. <laughs> so it's, well, yeah, yeah. it's like, um, I don't know. Like I, not, I, don't want, I don't want to be disrespectful, but right. yes, that's a lot. There's, that's the real conception in Italy. Yeah, you guys make pizza. Right. This is pizza. Right, right, right. That's so interesting, dude. Because so, there's no pepperoni pizza in Italy. Yeah. There's no such thing. If I say, dammi una pizza con pepperoni, they would give me with bell peppers on top. Really? Yeah, that's what it means. Oh. 
Sopri, sopre salsa would be the closest thing. Yeah. Spicy salami, but yeah, it's a whole like, yeah. Whole thing. It's a whole different thing. And for me, as an Italian American, like a true Italian American, um, pepperoni pizza is a flavor profile. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like people rate your pizza a On cheese, yeah. pepperoni, like what pepperonis do you use? If you use the cups, if you use this, mm -hmm. use that, yeah. It's just, it's a whole thing. So you're talking about pepperoni and pizza and all that stuff, makes me think like you do New York style pizza here, correct, yeah, yes. right? What, how did you go from just margaritas wood fired to, to New York style? Like what was the transition? How did this happen? Uh, it's what the people want. <laughs> That's, it's what the people need. Okay? Yeah, we, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, most people want a four dollar slice. They don't yeah. want some f fifteen fancy dollar margarita. Yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? And that's just because it takes more work to make a, a wood fire pizza than it would a uh, regular New York style pizza. Is that why? Like the cost mm, of it. For me, uh -huh. I I can bust out Neapolitan pizzas like this. Uh -huh. And New York, since it's eighteen inches, it right. takes a little bit more time because you want to get that even consistency through the dough and all that. So mm -hmm. yeah, like Neapolitan, ta 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 ta, boom, ta 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 ta. And you, if you're not cooking quick, you're burning your oven, and you probably need to have somebody watching the oven while you're making pizzas. Gotcha, okay, so that's why it's just more labor intensive, <laughs> right, is what you're saying? And you're gonna use better products. But then, for me though, like, I'm always, Caliano has its flavor profile. Like, even if it's wood fire pizza, New York style, square pizzas, you know what it is, there's that, you can still, I feel like I can still taste it all in all the pizzas, mm -hmm. so yeah. And, there's, and for me, I'm not, just because I'm making Neapolitan pizzas or making New York pizzas, I'm not going to be like, okay, I'm going to use a California tomato because, you know, it's a cheaper version. No, I'm going to use what I know because mm -hmm. I know how, that's how I make a good pizza. Right, right. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I, I've been to New York dozens of times. I love it. Yeah. Once day I aspire to live there just to live there and experience life. This is my version. I mean, I've eaten pizza everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Even the worst places you should probably should have, but it's just, <laughs> I want to try it, you know? It's funny you say that because I think when people have pizza, right, everyone has their own taste and flavor and that they like, but they will judge you based on what they like, right? And so they're going to say, your New York style pizza sucks, when in reality, you like everyone thinks their New York style pizza sucks, right? Oh, like, yeah. everyone has their own thing. Let's talk about that a little bit because I remember one thing you told me was everyone bases their flavor, their profile about like food they would eat growing up, right? Yes. Flavor pro profiles, yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? So pizza is such a more of a nostalgic comfort food. As Americans, it's like you associate it with Friday night family mm -hmm. or... Um, Elementary school parties. There you go. <laughs> See? Right, it, right. Pizza always has this like special place in people's hearts. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like... It's the number one consumed food in the world. I mean, probably only in California it's number two because we're such a Mexican food-based state. But mm. yes, anywhere you go. But it's more like even if your grandmother took you every Friday to eat Costco pizza, mm -hmm. when you eat Costco pizza, you're going to remember your grandmother putting her arm around you and saying, oh, you know, everything's going to be cool and all yeah. that. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's, it's, it's such, it's more than just the, a piece of food for more people. Right. It, it really invokes like good feelings. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that makes perfect sense because when you asked me that question, I was thinking to myself, what kind of pizza do I like? And I remember elementary school parties. I remember just getting a Domino's, a Pizza Hut, you know, and that was good to me back then. I was just like, this is amazing. And right, yeah. granted my flavor profiles changed a little bit, but thinking about those moments, like those were times like happiness, when you're young, you're with your family, all these things, you know, and it just okay. evokes a lot of memories growing yes. up and all of that. And all of that. Um, so taking it back to the business side, we talked about how you came from a food truck to now getting this spot right here. Yeah. Um, the transition from owning a food truck to having a brick and mortar, how was that for you? Everybody, this is just my opinion, but everybody feels like the food truck is the best introduction to the food world, you know? Yeah. It's probably the least financial restrictions. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because you, you're driving around, right? You don't have like a set spot and all uh, those things. No, no, you just, to open up a food truck, you can go down to your local commissary and ask a guy if he has a food truck to rent and you're renting a food truck driving around. 
you get your permits together, you can probably do that between five to 10 grand like that. Okay. To open up a brick and mortar, yes, there's a lot more, I don't know, how would you say? Like obligation, like you have a lease, right? Like a bigger rent to pay and all that stuff? Just bigger overhead. A big, uh, yeah, true, very true, okay. Um, so for example, um, here, you know, and I have um, insurance, mm -hmm. the things that you guys don't see as customers, but you know, it's, that's, it is what it is. But if you ask my opinion, if I could do it all over again, I would have saved up my money a little bit more mm -hmm. and just opened up a brick and mortar. The really thing- Oh, and skip the food truck? The thing about food trucks is in California, the, you're not really supposed to park on, or in San Diego County, because it's, it's governed by each county, yeah. is you're not supposed to really park on the sidewalk because there's not a place for people to wash their hands, oh. use the restroom, there's certain laws, but you know, as food truckers, we bend them. You have to drive around, politic with different people to set up, you know? For me, I got a little bit lucky with the food truck because it was during the um, brewery craze here, mm -hmm. and I went to all the top breweries and made pizza, pizza and beer. Who doesn't like Perfect pizza? Perfect combo, right? Yeah. So yeah. after a while, I just asked all the breweries kind of have one night, and after that, I kind of cons consistently built a schedule, and then on the weekends, did a lot of catering, and that's how I grew my reputation. And then one day, I was at Fall Brewing, and then there was a place down the street, and I said, how much do you want to go away? Uh huh. And I gave the lady the money, found an investor, and boom, started my first brick and mortar. Dude, and this is awesome, right? The brick and mortar as in this place, Caliano. No, no. I've had multiple oh, spots before Okay, this. okay, well, what, what was that before then? Oh, um. Like the spot was in North, was it? North Park. North Park, okay, yeah. okay. My first brick and mortar, I was the original owner of The Friendly. Mm -hmm. I, you know, every, everything that was to do with the friendly, how to open it, how it all started, everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was that was me and a and a partner, and yeah. we we busted it out. And some say it was one of the most successful openings in San Diego. Wow. And then we actually built it out in like 28 days. Yeah. Wow, dude, so fast. Well, yeah, like when you're hungry <laughs> or thirsty, right. you, you do whatever you can. It right. was like three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, painting, scraping walls. Just you, just you and him doing everything. Well, we had together. a crew. We okay. had a crew. Okay. We had a crew, and then we had one, like a guy came in and helped us did a lot of contracting. But That's for good. the most part, if you know the health department rules, you can take one restaurant and bust it up pretty fast. fast. Yeah, as long as you don't change out the kitchen, change out the dining room, and do all this crazy yeah. things. Well, yeah, the, it's pretty fast. Yeah, the, the, at the end of the day, the health department wants you to be successful so you can pay your bills and keep yeah. going, you know what right, I mean? Right, right. And they just want you to abide by them. So if you hmm. go in there and say, hey, excuse me, can you help me out? Explain it a little bit better. Yeah. Take a step back, reevaluate the situation. It's always better than just saying, well, if I cut this corner, I can save some money. If I cut this corner, I'll save some money. At the end of the day, excuse the language, but that shit will always bite you in the ass. So, so what that tells me, like, if you're, if you're trying to open a restaurant and all that stuff, don't cut corners. Mm. Follow, follow it by the book, right? Yeah, don't, go get all your permits, go get all your rights, certification, whatever, your business stuff. license, whatever. You never want somebody to come in. I mean, I remember my first restaurant. Mm -hmm. I got a letter in the mail that said, uh, I'm getting sued for t no less than 10,000. No, no less than 20,000, but no more than 10,000. Mm -hmm. So from 10 to $20,000, I had to pay this gentleman because my handicap signs. Yes, yes. We're not in the correct placement. I want to say five inches away from the threshold. Uh -huh. I want to say, what is it, 37 or 38 from the floor. Wow, dude. It's certain tech things, and he just, he's not a very nice gentleman because he knows how, how to fit. get you. Yes, and he's been, I've known multiple restaurant tour friends that he's gotten, and then from there on, you know, you learn from your lessons. You know, you know they, it's funny, not to cut, sorry to cut you off, man, but what you bring that up, and I know some other restaurants now experiencing exactly that thing. So They're all finding I can, them and doing it. So all I can tell you is, is you know, the little things. Mm -hmm. Make sure you take care of them. Yeah. This is probably the hardest world to operate, I feel, in the state of California. Yeah. Because if you're a little bit bigger, you're going to pay these really 
high, I don't know, from like fees, like uh, all that stuff, stuff from yeah. taxes right. to, to EDD, workman's yeah. comp, all this stuff. There's just different levels you have to operate in. And yeah. it, there's just, as a business owner, restaurateur, you figure what your smooth selling point is. Yeah. Because yeah. that's as a. Uh, Do you feel like it, you've hit that? Sometimes. <laughs> I feel like here is it's, it's good for me. Yeah. You're, we're open, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> we're open, yeah. Go for okay. it. Um, if you are, if the whole time you're spending your day fighting battles, putting out fires, how are you gonna focus on making money? Focus on making money. Hire the people that you know are gonna do the right job, or you feel they're gonna do the right job, and you just focus on making money. Mm -hmm. I mean. So take care of that stuff in the beginning from the get. Yes. So you don't have to worry about it. So you can just focus on money like you're saying. Yeah, because it's great advice. It, it, yes, because at the end of the day, if you're worried about the health department coming in, ABC coming in, this person coming in, that person coming in, right? And then when they come in, you get a huge fine and then you're like, oh shit, I'm behind the hole. Like, why why would you not just say, okay, this is what I need? Okay, this is what I need. All right. So then I'm not ready to open up. I right. need to get this together. Right. I need to get this together. And the best thing to do is go hire, or not hire somebody, but find somebody that, I'm not saying like me, but somebody that's experienced it and said, right. okay, well, what should I do so I don't mess up? Right, right. So like a consultant is what you're saying. Yeah, there's Some a lot of- guide you through it. Yeah, but don't, don't get taken for a ride. Yeah. You yeah. understand what I'm saying? Find, don't find a consultant because that's what he thinks he knows how to do. Find somebody because that's just applied theory. Okay. All right? Okay. Find somebody with experience. Uh -huh. Find somebody that was successful, <laughs> then wasn't successful, and then was successful again. Yeah, yeah. That's the guy you want to learn from. Ah, okay. How did, how did you lose it all? Yeah. And why did you lose it all? And then how did you get it all back? Mm. Okay. Mm. And how would you go about finding these people? Oh, there's a lot of us out there. Yeah? Oh, dude, I've lost so much money. Right, right, right. Yeah, I'm in a business. You're speaking from experience yourself, right? Yeah, I'm in, a, <laughs> I'm in an industry that's a 70% failure. When a yeah, bank man. sees me, they say, even before I give them my business plan. Yeah, they're like, no. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you next week. They don't even want to <laughs> talk. Then they won't. <laughs> they don't want to talk to me. Well, you're talking now for banks, if they don't want to get loaned a uh, quarter of a million dollars with so much interest to, mm -hmm. and all this that they don't want to talk to you. There's right. no there's no money in it for them. So yeah, and then you go to a small, hey, we want to help you out lending firm. Yeah, yeah. You have to jump through so many hoops yeah. just to be considered. And then there's a hundred people that are going to be considered. Mm -hmm. And if they like you, <laughs> they're you gonna get get, you're going to get 30, 40 K oh, and you're on the hook for 30, 40. Yeah. The best thing to do is find somebody that you wants to invest in, you believes it, and say, hey, you know what? This is my, here's my business plan, you know? This is how much I feel like if you invest, is how much you're gonna get. Because there's people that have money in the bank that yeah. are making no money for you. And they're willing, they're yeah. willing to do it. Yeah. So like, if I was, if I was trying to do that, how would I go about it? Like, what was the first, what's the first step you think I should take if, to find an investor? Well, first thing is come up with a business plan. Okay. Let's say, let's say I have that already then. Like, obviously, I, I, I want to do this business, and have this okay, plan. And, okay, the difference between somebody like me and an investor, I'm all like high in the sky, let's do this, let's do that. We, we, we can do this, we can do that. Excuse me, they don't give a fuck. <laughs> they want to see numbers. Uh, uh, okay, if, I, okay. if I give you 50K, mm -hmm. I give you 100K, how much? And when am I gonna get my money? Gotcha. And gotcha. how much am I gonna get more? Yeah, yeah. You understand? What sounds like is that you're a dreamer, right? You have all these plans, all these things. That you, you can see the success, but they want real. They want data. They want this. Yeah. They want tangible. Right, right, right. My ideas are just ideas. Mm -hmm. and their money is tangible. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. If it makes sense, it's gonna make dollars to them. Mm -hmm. If they can't make sense of it, it's, they're not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty simple. It's us who complicate things. So if you just say, okay, look, I make a really good product or I have a really good service mm -hmm. and this is how we can capitalize on that product or that service. This is the capital we need. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you'd say, okay, within 
X amount of years, X amount of months. Up, this is your return on your investment. This is yeah. your re this is your return on your loan, and, or you know what I mean. You can always have debt that's con converted into um, percentage of the business. There's all these things you can do, but just saying like, oh, I don't, I can't do it because I don't have it. Then you're not being creative enough. Right. And then when shit hits the fan, yeah, you're gonna fold easier. Right. Because for me, it's always like. One day this problem, the water heater goes out, I don't have the money for this, there's the grease flood over here, I have to clean this up, we have to close, the oven didn't work, you know, there's all these variables. Yeah. But you just set yourself up for success. Gotcha, gotcha, man. That was great, I think that's, that's great advice, especially if someone's watching this and they're like looking to start a business or they want to start something, mm -hmm. but they don't have the capital to do it, yeah. those steps will really help them get there. Yeah, like everybody loves Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the main thing on Shark Tank. Yeah, so what Shark Tank is like, if you actually look at Shark Tank, people don't invest in the product. Mm -hmm. They don't invest in the service. They invest in the person. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Most of my investors always invested in me because mm -hmm. they, they believed in me. My investors now believe in me. Yeah. They don't believe in anything else that, but, Mario is gonna do the work. Yes, and he's gonna perform like he said he was gonna do. Mm -hmm. And that's, if you kinda do that, then everything should work out for you. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say it will. <laughs> but should. It, it should. should. You know what yeah. I mean? Most yeah. people just. You said it's a 70% failure rate, so you know, that there's a reason why it's 70%. Yeah, it's just a different, it's just a different beast. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready for it, and you're not ready to work 16 hour days, I hate to say this, but you almost have to put your restaurant first and then your family second. Mm. Because it's, this is what takes care of your family. Right. And you wanna see your family happy, healthy, you know what I mean? And if you go, oh shit, I gotta leave because I gotta go to my daughter's recital, mm -hmm. I hope one day she'll understand that. All I ever do is for them. Right, right. But right. most people can't understand that concept. Right, right, right. Mo and it's a sacrifice. Yeah. Like, there's sometimes I say, damn, I miss that, I miss that. But then I look at what my kids are doing now and what they do and how they live and how they go to school and their educational experiences. Right. And then I just know it's worth it. Right, right. And that's not always gonna be the story, right? Like once your place becomes successful, you're able to be a part of those things more, right? Yeah, you, you can step away. Right, right. right. But most restaurateurs wanna step away within the first three months, mm -hmm. six months. I still don't step away. Gotcha. I got here early just so I can just, 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 um, Maybe clean here, yeah. restock there. Just the little things that, so my staff doesn't have to struggle through the day. Right, right. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. It's not about like anything else but setting up everybody for success. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? If I'm not making sure my staff is, you know, set up, then what am I doing? Right, right. Yeah. So by setting your staff up for success, you're setting yourself up to success. That's the only way it works. On. Yeah, that That's makes a lot of sense, man. I want to talk about this business talk. Everything's been great so far. I love it. Um, but I also want to talk about your items, right? Because we already talked about your pizza, New York style pizza, all that. But you have a bunch of other items that are great here too, right? Yeah, so my so. son and I would go to New York all the time. Okay. And one of the staples, and I'm I think everybody now, if you're on Instagram, has seen the gentleman that does your Aki way. Mm -hmm. So it's just a chopped cheese. It's just a chopped cheeseburger that you find in bodegas in New York. So us being, this is my East Coast version, you, of course you have to put it on. Right, right. And then being part of... So chopped cheese is just like a chopped up burger? That's all it is. Okay, okay. Just hammer on steroids. Okay. It's nothing else. Just, what else goes into it in your, in your chopped cheese? We do banana peppers. And grilled onions, um, lettuce, tomato, mayo, a toasted bun. Yeah, just keep it simple. I, I will vouch. This is a fire dish. <laughs> this is a really good. It's a really good thing. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I love fine dining. Um, I love the culinary world, but there's just two different things. 
Here is just greasy goodness, <laughs> fat boy shit, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. It's yeah, just, yeah. it just stuff that makes you happy. Right. I have customers that that's what they come for, and that's all they come for. We're a pizzeria, but they come for the chopped cheese. They come for the Philly. Um, we do the Philly a little bit different than other people. Mm. How do you do it different? We use banana pepper, so I think the acidity, oh. I think the acidity and the vinegar that sits in the banana pepper yeah. cuts to the fat a little bit differently. Okay. Mm. And then, yeah, we just, we, then we shred yeah. up the tr provolone, we kind of mix it together so it's like mm. gooier instead of just cheese on top of the meat. <laughs> That's it. Well, you know, okay. texture, well, we're talking about culinary, texture is a big thing. You yeah. Know? So still, if you make greasy goodness <laughs> and all that stuff, mm. you, uh, Still want to use, you know, chef-driven techniques, true, very cul true. culinary techniques, whatever you want to say. Yeah, and that's gonna improve your dish. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Well, that that even goes back to what you're saying, right? Like you find people that are gonna help you with in your business. Like literally, if you fall, you find someone who's successful and you you learn from them. How are you going to fail unless you just say, hey, you know, I know better than them, so I'm gonna do this instead, oh, and then you the, mess up. The the number one problem everybody in this world has is they don't know how to listen. Mm -hmm. Why somebody's talking, I even have the problem, yeah. is you're already ready to interject what they're saying instead of shutting the <laughs> up, digesting <laughs> what they're saying, and then we're like, hey, maybe there's some validity to that. Right, right. Maybe there's something to that. Yeah, yeah, instead yeah. of saying, well, I'm going to add something to this. Mm -hmm. I need to add something to the conversation. <laughs> Some, uh, listening is a very hard thing. My right. uncle, when I was growing up in Italy, told me, Mario, the one thing everybody wants in this world, just somebody to listen to. Mm -hmm. I'm being 43 years old, yep. When I get home, <laughs> right. when, I, uh, when I get home, I just want somebody to listen to my bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get what you're saying, man, I get what you're saying. But nobody really wants to listen. Yeah, it's yeah. a very difficult thing yeah. or characteristic to, I have it. I'm all over the place, so mm -hmm. for me to have a conversation and sit there and digest, it's difficult. But being 43 now and what my uncle is trying to teach me as a younger gentleman, that that resonates with me. Right, right. And I try. Mm -hmm. I try to make a conscious effort. Sometimes I'm not successful, <laughs> but I try to make a conscious effort. That's good, man. Always improving too, right? That's good. Yeah, you know, I want, I even me, I, I always want to find people that are more successful than me and or done bigger and better things than me because mm -hmm. I want to learn, you know? Yeah. How can I make my business better? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. My so, partner right now helps me out with that a lot. With listening? Yeah, well, he's one of them. He does a lot of different things for different restaurants in San Diego. So I just, when I have a very adverse situation or I'm ready to lose my temper, or lose my cool, I'll be like, look, I'm gonna step outside, I mean, bounce what's going off against him, because All right. I'm just, it's a, if you look at it in a different perspective, then you, maybe you can have a more insight on in how to handle the situation. All right, take it easy. You have a fantastic day, thank you. So, and uh, so I wanna ask you a question about business again. So we talked about your food, so people know all about it, right? Oh, you didn't even get to your pizza. Your New York, you talked about it a little bit earlier, but then like New York style pizza here, explain it a little bit so people don't know what it, what it is, what is it? If you, okay, if you understand pizza, and I've been making pizza, Long time, <laughs> long time. Yes, um, yeah, you know, like the fancy pe food, foodie pizzeria guys of the world, hydration, <laughs> this and that, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you understand dough, you understand the concept of yeast, altitude, temperatures, yeah. this and that, when to introduce different ingredients and how it uh, affects the elasticity of the dough. Because you've seen those Instagram photos where the guy in the New York, or the, um, Neapolitan, he's stretching it like this, and yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a whole different concept than New York style of dough. Ah, okay. So it's a completely different concept, and then like, just pizza in general is a different concept. Like, people don't I mean, people think that cheese sauce on top of bread is pizza. Mm -hmm. Flat bread, or all this and that. But it's, what ingredients you use, what um, source of uh, heat mm -hmm. from coal to wood to electric, 
deck, all this stuff. All that stuff, yeah. It all creates a different, I don't product. It's different now. It's not what we call in Napoli mm. pizza. Mm -hmm. So pockets throughout, how would you say, Cal I mean, the United States, you have different no. variations of pizza. Okay. How do you think some dude in Napoli is gonna get some casserole looking Chicago deep dish thing going? What is this? This is not a torta. This is not a pizza. This is not a torta. It's like a, it's a cake. Wow. Okay. You, you yeah, know yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. A, that's what. We, that's a different. Even a torta, you can say you can have a potato. Like, but it's just different. So not torta. Okay. They would say or like it just. That's not pizza to them. But to say that to some dude in Chicago. We're about to fight the dude. Yeah, 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 especially from Chicago. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, you know what I mean? Even like, right now, if you want to be cool and hip, the new style is New Haven, Connecticut. Mm. You've heard that? They will yeah, say yeah, yeah. NH in front of the pizza? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the cool hip thing, you know? It used to be Detroit. Now Detroit. Is it the same? No, because they're using coal fire. Oh. When you use wood fire, like we were talking about earlier, you're con you have a completely different heat source, so you're gonna get a completely different heat. What moisture is there in coal? I don't know. No, so you're not gonna, it's gonna be a completely different heat source. Oh. So then when they cook with it, they cook differently. Like, they're, when you cook with wood fire, you're gonna get that reading heat this way. When you have coal, all you're doing is creating a bed of charcoal or heat to warm up the whole deck oven. Mm. Does that make sense? Gotcha, gotcha. So that's why you have these crispy bubbles, this yeah. char on top of a Neapolitan pizza. Ah, okay. Okay, so it's just it's just a different concept. Is this so thick? I don't, no, I, it's I, like a cracker consistency. Oh. So New, New Haven, I don't want, so I'm not trying to offend anybody. Right, right, right. So it's just a little bit more of a cracker consistency. Yeah, yeah. And then, be, but there's a pocket of Neapolitans that, you know, immigrated to New Haven, Connecticut. That's why that pizza is so good. Oh. Wow, okay. okay. Well, that's where my family from Naples went to. Yeah. And then after one uh, winter, my grandmother said, either we move uh -huh. or we go back to Italy, because uh -huh. it's too cold. We talked about your New York style pizza, all of your items here, all of that stuff. I guess the last thing, one of the last things I want to ask you is like, um, you've experienced, you told me you guys have experienced a lot of success, or you are experiencing a lot of success. Um, what do you think has been the driving factor in getting you guys to this point? Sometimes you get lucky. You think it's luck? Yeah, and I, you know, I failed, a lot of success, failed, you know? It's, you know, I, I feel like I make good food, but like at the end of the day, like, I feel very fortunate that the number of customers come in and enjoy my food, mm -hmm. enjoy the sandwiches, the pizzas. Right. But as, as a food maker, you know, like, I, I think I make a pretty good pizza. Like, and it's just something that because I have a lot of experience and like different experiences than most people that translate into a very unique flavor profile, a very unique perspective, you know? A lot of my relatives in Italy don't think this is pizza, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, but they support me and it's pretty cool, you know? Um, if it wasn't for them, I, w I wouldn't be who I am today. Like. I'm more, I feel like more Italian than I am Californian. Mm. It's weird. Um, so you're saying luck was one thing, and obviously you're talking about your skill set here. Yeah, well, yeah, If you, you have to make a good product. Right. Yeah, but at the end of the day, like, I'm in a strip mall. Mm. In a very sleepy community, it's, very beautiful community. Oh, right, it's right. not like... I'm on a beaten path, I'm yeah. on a, I'm, you know what You're I mean? You're literally off the beaten path, bro. Yes. Like, the you biggest thing is Brandywine liquor over here, right? Yeah. Like, Yeah, so I feel very fortunate, feel very blessed that, like, people enjoy the pizza. Mm -hmm. And they come in and they say, this, this takes me to New York. And that, for me, like, yes, I need to pay my bills. Right. And I don't care about accolades, but I do care about my customers' satisfaction. Right. And a lot of them say, you know what? I'm glad I can get a good slice now in San Diego. And that for me is cool. And that's like a whole thing. That's a whole culture. Like people don't realize sliced pizza, rewarmed up, you know, it's a whole culture. It's not just pizza. 
You know what I mean? It's a whole culture. Like, even here in San Diego, we have, you know, a handful of awesome New York style pizzerias, you know, and they, they've developed a culture, you know? And that's, even in like LA, Pizza Nista, the whole like, you know, punk rock, I don't know. It's just, it's just a different thing than Neapolitan pizza, you know what I mean? So for me, we still have to give homage to Napoli and everything that they created, but this is a whole nother culture. This is a yeah. whole nother thing, you know what I mean? So it, for me, like it's a whole nother level of respect for people to come in and say, this page. The, the coolest thing is when we make them chicken parm, which is not anything you can find in Italy. It's, it's, there's no chicken parm in Italy. Uh, you know that, right? Uh -huh. There's no chicken parm. It's like, come along. This takes me home with their East Coast accent. <laughs> Yo, I like this, right? yeah. this, this. This brings me home right here. Love and I, that. that to me yeah. is the coolest shit ever. Right. Yeah, right. you gotta, if you don't appreciate your customer's happiness, I'm sorry, don't do this. Don't do this business. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it to make a dollar, You've already, you've, already, you've already set yourself up for failure because 70% of people fail in this industry. You have to show sincerity. You have to be genuine. You know what I mean? There is very few pizza Nazis in this world. Like, hey, you make some really good product. Treat me whatever way you want because I just want to eat your product. After a while, you get tired of being mistreated, right? So you have to be genuine. People mm -hmm. have to like you. If they don't like you, it's hard. It's hard to put your food on a plate. The only reason why chain restaurants in the United States are so successful is because it's based on comfort. It's based on familiarity. When I go to McDonald's, if it's in Iowa, Florida, California, I know I'm gonna get that Big Mac flavor. Mm. If I go to IHOP, I'm gonna get that Boysenberry syrup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's always, that's why in the United States, you always see chain restaurants successful because it's like, ah, oh, fuck it, I already know the flavor. You know I'm, what to expect. Yes, yeah. and it's, that's, it's a different thing. Like, yeah. like in Italy, dove si mangia bene? Where do you eat good, you know? Like, and that's where you want to go eat because at your house you cook better than at the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get you, but I get you. Wow. <laughs> Dude, a lot of gems in today's episode. This was great. I really appreciate the time, Mario. Oh, you're welcome, brother. Yeah, man. Um, if, you, if people wanted to sit, if they wanted to connect with you, what's the best way? Um, can you give us your address, your Instagram, social media, and like how, what would people? Oh, I just think Caliano Pizza SD, the, yeah. that just DM us, and, mm -hmm. you know? Address, what's your address here? Oh, 1655 Brandywine Avenue. But like I said, the famous Brandywine liquor store. Just saying of that, same plaza. <laughs> yeah. Same plaza. That was like one of the easy ways of me taking over this joint. Yeah. Is growing up in the South Bay, it was like Brandywine liquor store? Shit. You know where it is. You know where it is. <laughs> Everybody knows where it is. Oh, one more thing. What if people would first time comers if they want to come here, what pizza should they get? What other items should they get? Oh. So there's a standard. If you can't make a good cheese pizza, mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing matters. Yeah. So I'm gonna always tell you to watch, eat a cheese pizza. Yeah. Um, a lot of the my pizza makers, my employees, when they start working here, they always want the Hawaiian of this and that. Right, right. And then they come over to the dark side, and just cheese. <laughs> just cheese. <laughs> because you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's the dough, the ratio of cheese to sauce is the cheese salty, is the sauce sweet, all these little components. And that which makes a pizza. Then you put, like we say in Italy, tutti schivets, all this shit on top. Mm. And then, you know what I mean? Then you can, like, if you can't make a margarita in Italy, they're, they're not even gonna get let into the building, you know? Yeah. That's, it's just. So good cheese pizza? Yeah, because that's my flavor profile. Right, right, okay. And then you have the pepperoni, and you know what I mean? Like, even for me, like, why am I going to buy this high-end product that this dude thinks that he knew how to make? Because, no, it's 
pepperoni is like almost like a Slim Jim. Mm -hmm. When you eat a Slim Jim and you eat a pepperoni, that's it's oh, almost the it's fair. almost the same yeah, thing. Yeah, like texture wise, I can see what you're saying. I can see what yeah, you're even saying. that little yeah. bit of spiciness, yeah, yeah, yeah. that greasiness. That <laughs> if you actually squeeze a pepperoni before you cook it on your fingers, it like leaves that red residue. Right, right, right. The same shit on a Slim Jim. <laughs> the Everyone's is, gonna get yeah, a Slim Jim now oh, and squeeze yeah, it. But now, oh, I'm fancy. I use the cups. Yeah, they, yeah. they hold the grease. I mean, you're gonna pay oh, three God. times as much for your pepperoni mm -hmm. just because you want yeah. it. it. Pizza is a peasant food, yeah. okay? I know there's always the versions of upscale pizza, this and that. Yeah. But pizza was developed to feed the people, right. to, to feed the masses, not to be like this and that. And then from over, over time, yes, we had standards. But yeah, for the most part, it's, you know what I mean? You can't get more simplistic maybe pasta with pomodoro, then just a good, it's literally dough, sauce, cheese, basil, olive oil. That is a true, 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 true margarita pizza. Now you take somebody from who grew up in New York, and then they're gonna be like, this is burnt on the bottom, it's soupy on the top, it's all doughy. Mm. And when I try to pick up a slice, shit flops over. Right. This is pizza? No. To them, it's different things. So, yeah. Brother. Different friend. Well, yeah. thank you, Mario. Today was a really good episode. I think a lot of people get a lot of value from this. And come visit Caliano Pizza here in Chula Vista by Brandywine Liquor. No love. And come say hi to Mario. You know, he's always here hanging out. Everything like that. Thank you, dude. Appreciate Welcome. it. Appreciate the time.